Welcome to today's Triple Z. The Triple Z podcast is a daily program that you can use to help you fall asleep each night. Just turn down the volume, lay back, relax, and enjoy as you fall asleep. The Life and Achievements of Don Quixote de la Mancha is a Spanish epic novel by Miguel de Cervantes. Originally published in two parts, in 1605 and 1615, its full title is The Ingenious Gentleman Don Quixote of La Mancha. A founding work of Western literature, it is often labeled as the first modern novel and one of the greatest works ever written. Don Quixote is also one of the most translated books in the world. If you enjoy our program, Please be sure to write us a review on your podcast platform and share us with a friend. You both might sleep just a little better at night. Our website is triple Z, that's three Z's dot media. You can also like and share our content on Facebook or our Instagram account ZZZ Media Podcast. Music for today's episode was provided by the Sleep Channel on Spotify. Chapter 51 The Adventure of the Shepherd Lover and Other Truly Comical Passages Don Quixote stayed four days at Don Diego's house and during all that time met with a very generous entertainment. However, he then desired his leave to go and returned him a thousand thanks for his kind reception letting him know that the duty of his profession did not admit of his staying any longer out of action and therefore he designed to go in quest of adventures which he knew were plentifully to be found in that part of Spain and that he would employ his time in that till the tilts and tournaments began at Saragossa to which place it was now his chief intent to go. However, he would first go to Montesinos cave about which so many wonderful stories were told in those parts and there he would endeavor to explore and discover the source and original springs of the seven lakes commonly called the lakes of Ruidera. Don Diego and his son highly commended his noble resolution and desired him to command whatever their house afforded assuring him he was sincerely welcome to do it the respect they had for his honorable profession and his particular merit obliging them to do him all manner of service. In short, the day of his departure came, a day of joy and gladness to Don Quixote, but of grief and sadness to poor Sancho, who had no mind to change his quarters, and liked the good cheer and plenty at Don Diego's house, much better than his short hungry commons in forests and deserts, or the sorry pittance of his ill-stored wallets which he however crammed and stuffed with what he thought could best make the change of his condition tolerable. And now Don Quixote taking his leave of Don Lorenzo, Sir, said he, I don't know whether I have already said it to you, but if I have, give me leave to repeat it once more, that if you are ambitious of climbing up to the difficult and in a manner inaccessible summit of the Temple of Fame, your surest way is to leave on one hand the narrow path of poetry and follow the narrower track of knight errantry, which in a trice may raise you to an imperial throne. With these words, Don Quixote seemed to have summed up the whole evidence of his madness. However, he could not conclude without adding something more. Heaven knows, said he, how willingly I would take Don Lorenzo with me to instruct him in those virtues that are annexed to the employment I profess to spare the humble and crush the proud and haughty. But since his tender years do not qualify him for the hardships of that life and his laudable exercises detain him, I must rest contented with letting you know that one way to acquire fame in poetry is to be governed by other men's judgment more than your own for it is natural to fathers and mothers not to think their own children ugly, and this error is nowhere so common as in the offspring of the mind. Don Diego and his son were again surprised to hear this medley of good sense and extravagance, and to find the poor gentleman so strongly bent on the quest of these unlucky adventures, the only aim and object of his desires. 
After this, and many compliments and mutual reiterations of offers of service, Don Quixote having taken leave of the Lady of the Castle, he on Rosinante, and Sancho on Dapple, set out and pursued their journey. They had not traveled far when they were overtaken by two men that looked like students or ecclesiastics, with two farmers, all mounted upon asses. One of the scholars had behind him a small bundle of linen and two pairs of stockings dressed up in green buckram like a portmanteau. The other had no other luggage but a couple of foils and a pair of fencing pumps. And the husbandman had a parcel of other things which shewed that having made their market at some adjacent town, they were now returning home with their ware. They all wondered as indeed all others did that ever beheld him, what kind of fellow Don Quixote was, seeing him make a figure so different from anything they had ever seen. The knight saluted them, and perceiving their road lay the same way, offered them his company, entreating them, however, to move at an easier pace, because their asses went faster than his horse, and to engage them the more, he gave them a hint of his circumstances and profession, that he was a knight errant traveling round the world in quest of adventures, that his proper name was Don Quixote de la Mancha, but his titular denomination, the Knight of the Lions. All this was Greek, or peddler's French, to the countrymen, but the students presently found out his blind side. However, respectfully addressing him, Sir Knight, said one of them, if you are not fixed to any set stage, as persons of your function seldom are, let us beg the honor of your company, and you shall be entertained with one of the finest and most sumptuous weddings that ever was seen either in La Mancha or many leagues round it. The nuptials of some young prince, I presume, said Don Quixote. No, sir, answered the other, but of a yeoman's son and a neighbor's daughter, he the richest in all this country and she the handsomest you ever saw. The entertainment at the wedding will be new and extraordinary. It is to be kept in a meadow near the village where the bride lives. They call her Quiteria the Handsome by reason of her beauty and the bridegroom Camacho the Rich on account of his wealth. They are well matched as to age for she draws towards 18 and he is about two and twenty though some nice folks that have all the pedigrees in the world in their heads will tell ye that the bride comes of a better family than he but that is not minded nowadays for money, you know, will hide many faults. And, indeed, this same Camacho is as free as a prince and designs to spare no cost upon his wedding. He has taken a fancy to get the meadow shaded with boughs that are to cover it like an arbor so that the sun will have much ado to peep through and visit the green grass underneath. There are also provided for the diversion of the company several sorts of antics and morris dancers, some with swords and some with bells, for there are young fellows in his village that can manage them cleverly. I say nothing of those that play tricks with the soles of their shoes when they dance, leaving that to the judgments of their guests. But nothing that I have told or might tell you of this wedding is like to make it so remarkable as the things which I imagine poor Basil's despair will do. This Basil is a young fellow that lives next door to Quiteria's father. Hence arose an attachment like that of old between Pyramus and Thisbe, for Basil's love grew up with him from a child, and she encouraged his passion with all the kind return that modesty could grant insomuch that the mutual affection of the two little ones was the common talk of the village. But Quiteria coming to years of maturity, her father began to deny Basil the usual access to his house, and to cut off his farther pretense, declared his resolution of marrying her to Camacho, who is indeed his superior in estate, though far short of him in all other qualifications, for Basil is the cleverest fellow we have, he will pitch ye a bar, wrestle, or play at tennis with the best in the country. He runs like a stag, leaps like a buck, plays at nine pins so well, 
you would think he tips. Then down by witchcraft, sings like a lark, touches a guitar so rarely, he even makes it speak, and to complete his perfections, he handles a sword like a fencer. For that very single qualification, said Don Quixote, he deserves not only Quiteria the Handsome, but a princess, nay, Queen Guinevere herself, were she now living, in spite of Sir Lancelot and all that would oppose it. Well, quoth Sancho, who had been silent and listening all the while, my wife used to tell me she would have everyone marry with their match. All I say is, let honest Basil Ian marry her. For methinks I have a huge liking to the young man, and so heaven bless them together, say I, and Amurin sees those that will spoil a good match between those that love one another. Nay, said Don Quixote, if marriage should be always the consequence of mutual love, what would become of the prerogative of parents and their authority over their children? If young girls might always choose their own husbands, we should have the best families intermarry with coachmen and grooms, and young heiresses would throw themselves away upon the first wild young fellows whose promising outsides and assurance make them set up for fortunes, but all their stock consists in impudence. For the understanding, which alone should distinguish and choose in these cases as in all others, is apt to be blinded or biased by love and affection, and matrimony is so nice and critical a point that it requires not only our own cautious management, but even the direction of a superior power to choose right. Whoever undertakes a long journey, if he be wise, makes it his business to find out an agreeable companion. How cautious then should he be, who is to take a journey for life, whose fellow traveler must not part with him, but at the grave, his companion at bed and board, and sharer of all the pleasures and fatigues of his journey, as the wife must be to the husband. She is no such sort of wear that a man can be rid of when he pleases. When once that is purchased, no exchange, no sale, no alienation can be made, she is an inseparable accident to men, marriage is a noose, which, fastened about the neck, runs the closer, and fits more uneasy by our struggling to get loose, it is a Gordian knot which none can untie, and being twisted with our thread of life, nothing but the scythe of death can cut it. I could dwell longer on this subject, but that I long to know whether you can tell us anything more of Basil. All I can tell you said the student, is that he is in the case of all desperate lovers, since the moment he heard of this intended marriage, he has never been seen to smile, he is in a deep melancholy, talks to himself, and seems out of his senses, he hardly eats or sleeps, and lives like a savage in the open fields, his only sustenance a little fruit, and his only bed the hard ground, sometimes he lifts up his eyes to heaven, then fixes them on the ground, and in either posture stands, like a statue. In short, he is reduced to that condition that we who are his acquaintance verily believe that Quiteria's fatal yes of this wedding tomorrow will be attended by his death. Heaven forbid, cried Sancho. Who can tell what may happen? He that gives a broken head can give a plaster. This is one day, but tomorrow is another, and strange things may fall out in the roasting of an egg. After a storm comes a calm. Many a man that went to bed well has found himself dead in the morning when he awaked. Who can put a spoke in fortune's wheel? Nobody here, I am sure. Between a woman's yet and nay. I would not engage to put a pin's point so close they be one to another. If Mrs. Quiteria love Mr. Basil, she will give Camacho the bag to hold, for this same love, they say, looks through spectacles that makes copper like gold, a cart like a coach, and a shrimp like a lobster. Whither, in the name of ill luck, art thou running with thy proverbs now, Sancho? said Don Quixote. 
What dost thou know, poor animal, of fortune, or her wheel, or anything else? Why truly, sir, quoth Sancho, if you don't understand me, no wonder if my sentences be thought nonsense. But let that pass, I understand myself, and I am sure I have not talked so much like a ninny. But you, forsooth, are so sharp a cricket. A critic, blockhead, said Don Quixote, you mean. What makes you so angry, sir? Quoth Sancho, I was never brought up at school nor varsity to know when I murder a hard word. I was never at court to learn to spell, sir. Some are born in one town, some in another, one at St. Iago, another at Toledo, and even there all are not so nicely spoke. You are in the right, friend, said the student, those natives of that city who live among the tanners or about the market of Zocodover and are confined to mean conversation cannot speak so well as those that frequent the polite part of the town and yet they are all of Toledo. But propriety, purity, and elegance of style may be found among men of breeding and judgment. Let them be born where they will, for their judgment is in the grammar of good language, though practice and example will go a great way. It was now pretty dark, but before they got to the village, there appeared an entire blazing constellation. Their ears were entertained with the pleasing but confused sounds of several sorts of music, drums, fiddles, pipes, tabors, and bells, and as they approached nearer still, they found a large arbor at the entrance of the town stuck full of lights, which burnt undisturbed by the least breeze of wind. The musicians, which are the life and soul of diversion at a wedding, went up and down in bands about the meadow. Others were employed in raising scaffolds for the better view of the shows and entertainments prepared for the happy Camacho's wedding, and likewise to solemnize poor Basil's funeral. All the persuasions and endeavors of the students and countrymen could not move Don Quixote to enter the town urging for his reason the custom of knights errant who chose to lodge in fields and forests under the canopy of heaven rather than in soft beds under a gilded roof and therefore he left them and went a little out of the road full sore against Sancho's will who had not yet forgot the good lodging and entertainment he had at Don Diego's house or castle. Chapter 52 An Account of Rich Camacho's Wedding and what befell poor Basil. Scarce had the fair Aurora given place to the refulgent ruler of the day and given him time, with the he of his prevailing rays, to dry the liquid pearls on his golden locks, when Don Quixote, shaking off sluggish sleep from his drowsy limbs, arose and called his squire, but finding him still snoring, O thou most happy mortal upon earth, said he, how sweet is thy repose, envied by none, and envying no man's greatness, secure thou sleepest, thy soul composed and calm, no power of magic persecutes thee, nor are thy thoughts affrighted by enchantments. Sleep on, sleep on, a hundred times sleep on. Those jealous cares that break a lover's heart do not extend to thee neither the dread of craving creditors, nor the dismal foresight of inevitable want or care of finding bread for a helpless family keep thee waking. Ambition does not make thee uneasy, the pomp and vanity of this world do not perplex thy mind, for all thy care's extent reaches but to thy ass. Thy person and thy welfare thou hast committed to my charge, a burden imposed on masters by nature and custom to weigh and counterpoise the offices of servants. Which is the greatest slave? The servant's business is performed by a few manual duties which only reconcile him more to rest and make him sleep more sound while the anxious master has not leisure to close his eyes but must labor day and night to make provision for the subsistence of his servant not only in time of abundance but even when the heavens deny those kindly showers that must supply this want. 
To all this fine expostulation, Sancho answered not a word, but slept on, and was not to be waked by his master's calling or otherwise, till he pricked him with the sharp end of his lance. At length opening his eyelids halfway, and rubbing them, after he had gaped and yawned and stretched his drowsy limbs, he looked about him, and snuffing up his nose, I am much mistaken, quoth he, if from this same arbor there comes not a pure steam of a good rasher, that comforts my nostrils more than all the herbs and rushes hereabouts. And truly, a wedding that begins so savorily must be a dainty one. Away, cormorant, said Don Quixote, rouse and let us go see it, and learn how it fares with the disdained basil. Fair, quoth Sancho, why, if you be poor, you must e'en be so still, and not think to marry Quiteria. It is a pretty fancy for a fellow who has not a cross, to run nodding after what is meet for his betters. I will lay my neck that Camacho covers this same basil from head to foot with white sixpences, and will spend more at a breakfast than the other is worth, and be never the worse. And do you think that Madame Quiteria will quit her fine rich gowns and petticoats, her necklaces of pearl, her jewels, her finery and bravery, and all that Camacho has given her, and may afford to give her, to marry a fellow with whom she must knit or spin for her living? What signifies his bar pitching and fencing? Let me beseech you, good Sancho, interrupted Don Quixote to bring thy harangue to a conclusion. For my part, I believe, wert thou let alone when thy clack is once set a-going, thou wouldst scarce allow thyself time to eat or sleep, but wouldst prayed on to the end of the chapter. Troth, master, replied Sancho, your memory must be very short not to remember the articles of our agreement before I came this last journey with you. I was to speak what I would, and when I would, provided I said nothing against my neighbor or your worship's authority, and I don't see that I have broken my indentures yet. I remember no such article, said Don Quixote, and though it were so, it is my pleasure you should now be silent, for the instruments we heard last night begin to cheer the valleys, and doubtless the marriage will be solemnous this morning ere the he of the day prevent the diversion. Thereupon Sancho said no more, but saddled Rosinante, and clapped his pack saddle on Dapple's back, then both mounting, away they rode fair and softly into the arbor. The first thing that blessed Sancho's sight there was a whole steer spitted on a large elm before a mighty fire made of a pile of wood that seemed a flaming mountain. Round this bonfire were placed six capacious pots, cast in no common mold, or rather six ample coppers, every one containing a whole shamble of meat, an entire sheep were sunk and lost in them, and soaked as conveniently as pigeons. The branches of the trees round were all garnished with an infinite number of cased hairs, and plucked fowls of several sorts, and then for drink, Sancho told above three score skins of wine, each of which contained above twenty-four quarts, and, as it afterwards proved, sprightly liquor. A goodly pile of white loaves made a large rampart on the one side, and a stately wall of cheeses set up like bricks made a comely bulwark on the other. Two pans of oil, each bigger than a dyer's vat, served to fry their pancakes, which they lifted out with two strong peels when they were fried enough, and then they dipped them in as large a bottle of honey prepared for that purpose. To dress the provisions, there were above fifty cooks, men and women, all cleanly, diligent, and cheerful. In the ample belly of the steer, they had stewed up twelve little sucking pigs to give it the more savory taste. Spices of all sorts lay about in such plenty that they appeared to be bought by wholesale. In short, the whole provision was indeed country-like but plentiful enough to feast an army. Sancho beheld all this with wonder and delight. The first temptation that captivated his senses was the goodly pots, 
by and by he falls desperately in love with the skins of wine, and lastly, his affections were fixed on the frying pans, if such honorable kettles may accept of the name. The scent of the fried meat put him into such a commotion of spirit that he could hold out no longer, but accosting one of the busy cooks with all the smooth and hungry reasons he was master of, he begged his leaf to sop a luncheon of bread in one of the pans. Friend, quoth the cook, no hunger must be felt near us today, thanks to the founder. A light man, and if thou canst find ever a ladle there, skim out a pullet or two, and much good may they do you. A lackaday, quoth Sancho, I see no ladle, sir. What a silly helpless fellow thou art, cried the cook. Let me see. With that he took a kettle, and sousing it into one of the pots, he fished out three hens and a couple of geese at one heave. Here, friend, said he to Sancho, take this, and make shift to stay your stomach with that scum till dinner be ready. Heaven reward you, cried Sancho, but where shall I put it? Here, answered the cook, take ladle and all, and thank the founder once more I say, nobody will grudge at thee. While Sancho was thus employed, Don Quixote saw twelve young farmers' sons, all dressed very gay, enter upon stately mares, as richly and gaudily equipped as the country could afford, with little bells fastened to their furniture. These in a close body made several careers up and down the meadow, merrily shouting and crying out long live Camacho and Quiteria. He is rich and she is fair and she the fairest in the world. Poor ignorance, thought Don Quixote, overhearing them, you speak as you know, but had you ever seen my Dulcinea del Toboso, you would not be so lavish of your praises. Chapter 53 The Progress of Camacho's Wedding with Other Delightful Accidents Don Quixote and Sancho were now interrupted by a great noise of joy and acclamation raised by the horsemen who, shouting and galloping, went to meet the young couple who, surrounded by a thousand instruments and devices, were coming to the arbor accompanied by the curate, their relations, and all the better sort of the neighborhood set out in their holiday clothes. Heyday, quoth Sancho, as soon as he saw the bride, what have we here? Truly this is no country lass, but a fine court lady, all in her silks and satins. Look, look ye, master, see if, instead of glass necklaces, she have not on fillets of rich coral, and instead of green serge of quencha, a thirty-piled velvet. Bless us, see what rings she has on her fingers, no jet, no pewter baubles, but pure beaten gold, and set with pearls too, if every pearl be not as white as a syllabub, and each of them as precious as an eye. How she is bedizened, and glistens from top to toe! And now yonder again, what fine long locks the young slut has got, if they be not false, I never saw longer in my born days. Ah, what a fine stately person she is! What a number of trinkets and glaring gewgaws are dangling in her hair and about her neck! Well, I say no more, but happy is the man that has thee. Don Quixote could not help smiling to hear Sancho set forth the bride after his rustic way, though at the same time he beheld her with admiration. The procession was just arrived when they heard a piercing outcry and a voice calling out, Stay, rash and hasty people, stay. Upon which, all turning about, they saw a person coming after them in a black coat, bordered with crimson powdered with flames of fire. On his head he wore a garland of mournful cypress and a large truncheon in his hand headed with an iron spike. As soon as he drew near, they knew him to be the gallant Basil, and seeing him come thus unlooked for, and with such an outcry and behavior, began to fear some mischief would ensue. 
He came up tired and panting before the bride and bridegroom, then leaning on his truncheon, he fixed his eyes on Criteria, and with a fearful hollow voice, too well you know, cried he, unkind Criteria, that by the ties of truth and the laws of that heaven which we all revere, while I have life you cannot be married to another. You are now about to snap all the ties between us and give my right to another whose large possessions, though they can procure him all other blessings, I had never envied, could they not have purchased you. But no more. It is ordained, and I will therefore remove this unhappy obstacle out of your way. Live, rich Camacho, live happy with the ungrateful criteria many years, and let the poor, the miserable Basil die, whose poverty has clipped the wings of his felicity and laid him in the grave. Saying these words, he drew out of his supposed truncheon a short tuck that was concealed in it, and setting the hilt of it against the ground, he fell upon the point in such a manner that it came out all bloody at his back, the poor wretch weltering on the ground in blood. His friends, strangely confounded by this sad accident, ran to help him, and Don Quixote, forsaking Rosinante, made haste to his assistance, and taking him up in his arms, found there was still life in him. They would have drawn the sword out of his body, but the curate urged it was not convenient till he had made confession and prepared himself for death, which would immediately attend the effusion of blood upon pulling the tuck out of the body. While they were debating this point, Basil seemed to come a little to himself, and calling on the bride, oh, Quiteria, said he, with a faint and doleful voice, now, now, in this last and departing minute of my life, even in this dreadful agony of death, would you but vouchsafe to give me your hand, and own yourself my wife, I should think myself rewarded for the torments I endure, and pleased to think this desperate deed made me yours, though, but for a moment I would die contented. The curate, hearing this, very earnestly recommended to him the care of his soul's health, which at the present juncture was more proper than any other worldly concern, that his time was but short, and he ought to be very earnest with heaven in imploring mercy and forgiveness for all his sins, but especially for this last desperate action. To which Basil answered that he could think of no happiness till Criteria yielded to be his, but if she would do it, that satisfaction would calm his spirits and dispose him to confess himself heartily. Don Quixote, hearing this, cried out aloud that Basil's demand was just and reasonable and Senior Camacho might as honorably receive her as the worthy Basil's widow, as if he had received her at her father's hands. Camacho stood all this while strangely confounded, till at last he was prevailed on by the repeated importunities of Basil's friends to consent that Quiteria should humor the dying man, knowing her own happiness would thereby be deferred but a few minutes longer. Then they all bent their entreaties to Quiteria, some with tears in their eyes, others with all the engaging arguments their pity could suggest. She stood a long time inexorable and did not return any answer till at last the curate came to her and bid her resolve what she would do, for Basil could not now live many minutes. Then the poor virgin, trembling and dismayed, without speaking a word, came to Basil, who lay gasping for breath, with his eyes fixed in his head as if he were just expiring, she kneeled down before him, and with the most manifest signs of grief beckoned to him for his hand. Then Basil opening his eyes, and fixing them in a languishing posture on hers, oh, Quiteria, said he, your heart at last relents when your pity comes too late. Thy arms are now extended to relieve me when those of death draw me to their embraces, and they, alas, are much too strong for thine. All I desire of thee, O oh fatal beauty, is this, let not that fair hand deceive me now, as it has done before, but confess that what you do is free and voluntary, without constraint or in compliance to anyone's commands, declare me openly thy true and lawful husband, thou wilt not sure dissemble with one in death, 
and deal falsely with his departing soul that all his life has been true to thee? In the midst of all this discourse he fainted away and all the bystanders thought him gone. The poor Quateria, with blushing modesty, took him by the hand and with great emotion, no force, said she, could ever work upon my will, therefore believe it purely my own free will that I here declare you my only lawful husband, here is my hand in pledge, and I expect yours as freely in return if your pains and this sudden accident have not yet bereft you of all sense. I give it to you, said Basil, with all the presence of mind imaginable, and here I own myself thy husband. And I thy wife, said she, whether thy life be long, or whether from my arms they bear thee this instant to the grave. Methinks, quoth Sancho, this young man talks too much for one in his condition, pray advise him to leave off his wooing and mind his soul's health. I suspect his death is more in his tongue than between his teeth. Now when Basil and Quateria had thus plighted their faith to each other, while yet their hands were joined together, the tender-hearted curate, with tears in his eyes, poured on them both the nuptial blessing, beseeching heaven, at the same time, to have mercy on the new-married man's soul, and in a manner mixing the burial service with the matrimonial. As soon as the benediction was pronounced, up starts Basil briskly from the ground and with an unexpected activity whips the sword out of his body and caught his dear Quateria in his arms. All the spectators stood amazed and some of the simpler sort stuck not to cry out a miracle, a miracle. No miracle, cried Basil, no miracle, but a stratagem. The curate more astonished than all the rest, came to feel the wound and discovered that the sword had nowhere passed through the cunning Basil's body, but only through a tin pipe full of blood artfully fitted close to him and, as it was afterwards known, so prepared that the blood could not congeal. In short, the curate, Camacho, and the company found they had all been egregiously imposed upon. As for the bride, she was so far from being displeased that, hearing it urged that the marriage could not stand good in law because it was fraudulent and deceitful, she publicly declared that she again confirmed it to be just and by the free consent of both parties. Camacho and his friends, judging by this that the trick was premeditated and that she was privy to the plot, had recourse to a stronger argument and, drawing their swords, set furiously on Basil, in whose defense almost as many were immediately unsheathed. Don Quixote immediately mounting with his lance couched and covered with his shield, led the van of Basil's party and falling in with the enemy, charged them briskly. Sancho, who never liked any dangerous work, resolved to stand neuter and so retired under the walls of the mighty pot whence he had got the precious skimmings thinking that would be respected whichever side gained the battle. Don Quixote, addressing himself to Camacho's party, hold, gentlemen, cried he, it is not just thus with arms to redress the injuries of love. Love and war are the same thing and stratagems and policy are as allowable in the one as in the other. Quateria was designed for Basil and he for her by the unalterable decrees of heaven. Camacho's riches may purchase him a bride and more content elsewhere and those whom heaven has joined let no man put asunder for I here solemnly declare that he who first attempts it must pass through me and this lance through him. At which he shook his lance in the air with so much vigor and dexterity that he cast a sudden terror into those that beheld him who did not know the threatening champion. In short, Don Quixote's words, the curate's mediation, together with Quateria's inconstancy, brought Camacho to a truce and he then discreetly considered that since Quateria loved Basil before marriage, it was probable she would love him afterwards and that, therefore, he had more reason to thank heaven for so good a riddance than to repine at losing her. This thought, 
improved by some other considerations, brought both parties to a fair accommodation, and Camacho, Tishui did not resent the disappointment, blaming rather Criteria's levity than Basil's policy, invited the whole company to stay and take share of what he had provided. But Basil, whose virtues, in spite of his poverty, had secured him many friends, drew away part of the company to attend him and his bride to her own town, and among the rest, Don Quixote, whom they all honored as a person of extraordinary worth and bravery. Poor Sancho followed his master with a heavy heart. He could not be reconciled to the thoughts of turning his back so soon upon the good cheer and jollity at Camacho's feast, and had a strange hankering after those pleasures which, though he left behind in reality, he had carried along with him in mind. The new married couple entertained Don Quixote very nobly. They esteemed his wisdom equal to his valor and thought him both a Cid in arms and a Cicero in arts. Basil then informed them that Quiteria knew nothing of his stratagem, but being a pure device of his own, he had made some of his nearest friends acquainted with it, that they should stand by him if occasion were, and bring him off upon the discovery of the trick. It deserves a handsomer name, said Don Quixote, since conducive to so good and honorable an end as the marriage of a loving couple. By the way, sir, you must know that the greatest obstacle to love is want and a narrow fortune, for the continual bands and cements of mutual affection are joy, content, and comfort. These, managed by skillful hands, can make variety in the pleasures of wedlock, preparing the same thing always with some additional circumstance to render it new and delightful. But when pressing necessity and indigence deprive us of those pleasures that prevent satiety, the yoke of matrimony is often found very galling and the burden intolerable. These words were chiefly directed by Don Quixote to Basil to advise him by the way to give over those airy sports and exercises which indeed might feed his youth with praise, but not his old age with bread, and to bethink himself of some grave and substantial employment that might afford him a competency and something of a stock for his declining years. Then pursuing his discourse, the honorable poor man, said he, when he has a beautiful wife, is blessed with a jewel, he that deprives him of her robs him of his honor and may be said to deprive him of his life. The woman that is beautiful and keeps her honesty when her husband is poor deserves to be crowned with laurel as the conquerors were of old. Beauty is a tempting bait that attracts the eyes of all beholders and the princely eagles and the most high-flown birds stoop to its pleasing lure. But when they find it in necessity, then kites and crows and other ravenous birds will all be grappling with the alluring prey. She that can withstand these dangerous attacks well deserves to be the crown of her husband. However, sir, take this along with you, as the opinion of a wise man whose name I have forgot, he said, there was but one good woman in the world, and his advice was, that every married man should think his own wife was she as being the only way to live contented. For my own part, I need not make the application to myself, for I am not married, nor have I any thoughts that way, but if I had, it would not be a woman's fortune, but her character should recommend her, for public reputation is the life of a lady's virtue, and the outward appearance of modesty is in one sense as good as the reality since a private sin is not so prejudicial in this world as a public indecency.